Hello and welcome to our podcast about Yiddish. First, let's look at an article from an Argentinian Yiddish socialist newspaper that was written in dedication to my great-great-grandfather after his death in 1971. Geboren in 1897 in Jedinez, Bessarabie, is er gekommen ken Argentine in Jahr 1920. Von Fach a Schneider hat der Verstorbener Eibig um Ruika Kuppermann gecholmt von Wern an Erdarbeiter. Later on, it was written that he had gefeiert a hore passion im Leben. These sections of the text contain the three main components of the Yiddish language. But what are those? Yiddish is a so-called fusion language, where the vocabulary and structure are implemented for multiple language groups. The three main components of Yiddish are German, Hebrew and Slavic. Let's look at the three words from the text. Ken originates from the old German word gen, which translates into the preposition to in English. Hore Paschnem is a Slavism and means hard work. Gecholemt is a Hebrewism with an interesting structure of the verb to dream or lachlom in Hebrew. However, in this case, it is put into the past tense using German grammar rules. This is a perfect example of why Yiddish is a fusion language because the grammar and vocabulary of the different components even mix with each other. This creation of a fusion language happened over many years when the Jewish population moved to different locations across Europe and got in contact with many different languages, from which components were then implemented. Each new language family that the Yiddish language came in touch with developed its grammar and vocabulary. But let's look at how it started. When the Jewish population was excluded from society during the Crusades, a known German dialect developed among this population. This was Yiddish. The first known document written in Yiddish is the so-called Broche, which translates into congratulation. It can be found in the old book called Machzor of Worms, which was released in 1272. Just like all other German dialects, however, Yiddish was the first mainly spoken and had no specific grammatical rules. Jewish literature and holy writings were written in Hebrew. Due to that, Hebrew words were implemented into the dialect. It is therefore not surprising that many of the Hebrewisms are words that notably occur in the Bible, but also words that express in Jewish culture and rituals. However, this can only be compared to modern Hebrew to a certain extent, since it has a different vocalization and therefore a different spelling. At this early stage of development of the Yiddish language, the Jewish population that spoke it lived in Western European countries such as Germany, Switzerland or the Netherlands, giving the Yiddish of this time period the name Western Yiddish. With the years as a result of pogroms on one hand and many Jews adapting to the local language of the rest of the population on the other hand, the center of the Jewish population moved to Eastern Europe. Since the Jewish people also spoke the local languages of the non-Jewish population, which were mostly Slavic, the Yiddish language got heavily impacted by those, meaning that it's further developed with Slavisms. This later type of Yiddish is called Eastern Yiddish. Being considered rather a jargon than a language for a very long time, Yiddish was called die Sprache von die Weiber und die Amoretzim, the language of the women and the uneducated. Yiddish literature was about religious themes and was written mainly for women, which during that period of time mostly had less education than men. A new era started in the late 19th century when there was an idea to establish high-level Yiddish literature. Sholem Yankev Abramovich, known as the grandfather of modern Yiddish literature, released Yiddish writings under the pseudonym Mendele Moichers Forim, which means Mendele the bookseller. His works contain detailed satirical descriptions about the life and manners of small-town Jewry in Tsarist Russia. The second big Yiddish writer of the time was Sholem Aleichem, who gave an insight into the Jewish mentality using delightful humor. The third big writer of the time is Yitzchok Leibush Peretz, who countered realism with romanticism. These are the so-called big three of modern Yiddish literature. Since the Yiddish-speaking population had distributed around many parts of Eastern Europe, different dialects had been created over time. These could be divided into three main dialects. Polish, Lithuanian and Ukrainian. Many words are spelled differently in the different dialects. In order to solve this, neutral balances were found by abolishing intrusions of the component words from the fusion languages. While the literary languages of German and Russian were used as models, the pronunciation was heavily based on the Lithuanian dialect because Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, was a major Jewish cultural center and home to the most prestigious elite groups of Yiddish speakers. Despite that, Warsaw and later New York were Yiddish culture centers as well. All of them were flourishing and had many attractions held in Yiddish, such as theaters and cinemas. Another important thing to mention is the 1908 Chernovitz Congress, in result of which Yiddish was recognized as a national language for the Jewish people. Six years later, the first Yiddish literature dictionary was published. Since the first edition was not very accurate, author Salman Reisen wanted the readers to complement the dictionary by handing in completions to a certain given address. An improved version was released in 1926. 
This was briefly it about the Yiddish history from its beginnings until the early 20th century. Now we are going to discuss what impact the Holocaust had on the Yiddish culture and its speakers before the war. Whilst in the 1930s a more and more anti-Semitic policy was established, civil rights were taken away from the Jews. In most East European states, the Jews were excluded from the society, also often with violence. After Hitler's aggression of Poland in 1939, most of the Yiddish speakers were exposed to the annihilation policy. About 5.2 million Yiddish speakers from Poland, the Soviet Union, Hungary, Romania and Czechoslovakia were killed by Germans and their allies. The murder of millions of Jews is called der Czerben in Yiddish. Czerben is a Hebrew word and means the destruction. Before the Jews were exported to working camps, they were locked in ghettos. In order to survive it, it was essential to communicate without God's understanding them. That's why more Hebrew Aramaic words were used. After the war, the Jewish life in Europe was destroyed and only a few Yiddish speakers were alive. For the ones who survived, going back to their normal life was impossible. Their friends and family were all dead, their homes destroyed, their belongings gone. Most of them fled to Germany or Austria, where they lived in a reception camp. They were called displaced person, in Yiddish, Sheires Chableite. Already in 1945, the Jewish refugees and survivors started to organize themselves internationally. They were supported by help organizations from America, Palestine and other countries. All the interaction and communications happened in Yiddish. And after the establishment of Israel in 1948 and new migration policies in the USA, the migration was much quicker and after a few years these camps could be closed. In the Soviet Union there was not a lot of Yiddish culture left after the war and also no big motivation to reintegrate it again. Under the rule of Stalin the anti-Semitism got stronger and after 1948 all Yiddish cultural institutions were closed and many Jewish intellectuals, writers and scientists had to go to prison. After Stalin's death the situation for Jews got better. The culture spread throughout the whole Soviet Union. There were even courses to learn Yiddish. But in general, in East countries, the number of Yiddish speakers decreased. A lot of people were estranged by their homeland and they didn't value their native language, meaning Yiddish. Others wouldn't stand out because of the anti-Semitic attitude, which was still spreading. For example, in Poland lived more than 3 million Jews, but after the war, there were only 350,000 people left. And because of the mass migration from the destructive countries, less than 90,000 Jews were still living in Poland by 1947. The same kind of developments happened in other East European countries. Because of an afflux of survivors and refugees, the number of Yiddish speakers increased in areas like New York, Buenos Aires, Johannesburg and Tel Aviv. During this migration, the Jews separated themselves into two groups. One was more mundane, liberal and modern orthodox, while the other group was more traditional orthodox. The traditional ones built their own network and religious facilities and ended the contact to the outer world. In, compar in comparison, the liberal group tried to integrate themselves more into their new culture and homeland and switch to the language of the country. But all in all, the number of members in Yiddish schools, cultural organizations and trade unions stagnated and slowly decreased, and no one could help it. At the end of the 1970s, most Jewish schools in North and South America switched to the national language or only taught the modern Hebrew. So that was our podcast and we hope you know more about the Yiddish language and culture now.